welcome, welcome. Isaac, it's so, so nice to have you. Um, I was just telling you before we started recording how excited I am to have a chat with you because I feel that you hit on so many important topics when it comes to entrepreneurship and our health and overall well being. So I'm really curious to talk to you about it. Uh, I think this is going to be great for the audience. But before we dive into that, tell us a little bit about how did you come about to be where you are today? If you just give us a snapshot of your career story. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, how I came to where I am today really started um, with really my personal experiences growing up as a child. You know, I'm, I'm Asian American. So growing up in a community with no other Asian people in the United States, my parents came here from from Taiwan. And so being like the first, you know, Chinese American person in a community, it really made me feel like I didn't belong. And on top of that, I was also overweight. And that's really how I got started in health. Because one day I just went, man, not only am I Asian, but I'm also overweight. And I feel like I'm just this easy target. I felt, felt like I didn't belong. And I had a lot of shame around my body. I had a lot of shame around who I was. And that's really why I picked health and fitness up. I, I picked up this men's health magazine. I committed to the diet I worked out. And what it shifted inside of me was when I went back to school, Elena, no one, no one could recognize who I was. They couldn't believe I was the same person. And that's when I fell in love with transformation. And from there, I, I actually, my parents, and I was listening to one of your, uh, your interviewees talking about, you know, parents want you to do these things. And my parents actually wanted me to be a, a network systems administrator for information technology. So that's what I studied. I studied computer systems and I remember sitting there loading servers up and going, wow, like I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. This is it. And I, I just, I just couldn't. And I stopped. I was two classes short for my degree. And I, and I did what I fell in love with in transformation, which was helping people with their health. And I did that to a point until I had a gym and I realized that people would work out and they'd make the time, they'd make the effort, and then they'd get hurt. And they'd go see a physical therapist, they'd go see a doctor, and I'd call them up a year later, six months, and they were still hurt. And I went, wow, people really need to be healthy because you can't even push the envelope of health, fitness, and transformation if you're not actually healthy. And that led me into being very curious about all the different things it takes to be healthy, the emotional wellness around health. And, um, you know, this is never a short story, but event but ultimately the thing that I was curious about is when I had a solution, another problem popped up. <laughs> so like, how do we solve the unsolvable problem? Which for, for me is like, how do you be a really fulfilled human being who's actually really just happy? And that means happy with your finances, happy with your relationships, happy with, if you're a business owner like myself, happy with the business that you have. And that to me felt like an unsolvable problem because I've talked to entrepreneurs who are really successful and they never saw their kids. I talked to entrepreneurs who are really successful and they have really bad backs, be going in for surgeries. And I knew from my experience that if I followed the right mentor, I'd find the right answer. But the problem is, is I didn't find one mentor who had the answer. So I kept finding different mentors and different mentors. And what actually happened for me was I found a mentor who specialized in teaching how the subconscious mind works when it comes to change, specifically around sales. And that person allowed me to look at my beliefs and actually create programs that got me out of being someone who owned a business that was working in his business to someone who was actually a business owner. And it actually gave me the lifestyle that I wanted. And to me, one of the reasons why I love sales is because if we want to have the whole picture of what we want, we have to address money and we have to address our money beliefs. And if we don't know what our money beliefs are, how are we going to be in a sales conversation with someone else about their money beliefs? And so that was something that I found um, brought me a lot of interest because I grew up with my dad being Asian American. You know, my dad grew up very, very poor and his dad left when he was little. He didn't have a dad. Uh, my dad literally wrapped me on the streets of California. So he had a lot of money beliefs that I inherited. And so I'm this entrepreneur, I'm making money. And I realized that I'm not going far because I don't know what my own money beliefs are. I can't see them that my dad handed them to me. And because of that, I'm running my whole business off money beliefs that are completely unconscious to me. And so that's really, you know, how I ended up here is because I realized, well, we need help in beliefs. There's strategy to business, there's strategy to health. The strategy to healing, but all of those are irrelevant without the correct beliefs. Yeah, it's uh, there. There's so many good things that you mentioned. I'm just trying to like unravel all of this now. It's um, 
Uh, listen, it's just to kind of start with what you mentioned. First of all, I think that anytime we hit some kind of struggle or we feel like we don't fit in somewhere, what, what I love to see is that we kind of take that struggle and we turn it into something positive. So how can I, how can I do that? And, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm always curious because it's like some people go that route with, where they're just investing themselves hardcore and then other people go into the not so great way and they end up in kind of more trouble. So I'm always curious to, to know, but I don't know if there's an answer to, I mean, I think that's just going into more of a psychological experiment there, but, but it's, it's, it's very relatable um, from my side as well. I, I uh, migrated from Russia when I was 13 and also didn't feel like I fit in, didn't speak very good English, had my own body image issues and stuff like that. Um, I did not go into sports right away, but there was definitely a mind shift to where like, it's almost like you have something to prove. And I don't know if that's relatable to you, but it's like, it's almost like when you don't fit in, you have something you have to prove. And, but I feel like there's a, there's a beauty in that as well, you know, cause then it like pushes you. Was, was that, so, do you, do, does that make you feel like that? Like, was Yeah. That oh, I, I completely relate with you. Like I, you know, it's actually funny. I looked like in my mid twenties, I did a lot of internal searching. I realized, man, I don't have any Asian friends. And I realized, cause I felt like, if I was next to a bunch of Asian people, I just vanished. Like what's special about me? And then it, it was very threatening for me. And um, I needed to feel like I stood out in a good way because growing up in, an, in a not belonging, it's like I worked hard to be different in a positive way. It's almost like that positive stereotype that we hear about. Like people that are Asian descent, they're like this. People that are black are like this. And it's like, man, I've got to have some kind of positive, positive, positive stereotype. And if the person next to me is that thing, but better, what's my worth now? Yeah. And th that's, that's, that, that's so um, interesting because then it kind of goes to that financial, the thought, the thought process of how we see finances and it. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. Um, it's scary to imagine that you can be in a better position that you are today. So subconsciously, as much as we all want, and this is what I'm curious like to hear from your side, as much as we all want to reach some kind of success, oftentimes we're scared to put a number to that success because we feel we're not worth it or we have, because of this subconscious thoughts that we have about money. What, have you seen that? Is that like when you, when you were talking about subconscious and, and, and our beliefs, is that something that comes up with your clients? Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you, that you mentioned that Elena, the, one of the things that I help clients shift is first they have to shift inside themselves. So whenever we want to make a change and we're set a certain way, and this, this doesn't matter if it's in fitness, it's in pain, it's in sales, it's in finances, is that we have what's called homeostasis, which is, you know, the scientific term for the body fights for this current situation. So if we want to have a better life, we have to fight against everything inside us currently that creates us having this life exactly as it is right now, mm. which means that you have to fight ego. Mm. And ego just means that's your current sense of self. And the way ego works is it wants to help you survive. So when you watch a ball bounce, like you ever watch, like I have a two-year-old son. And if I throw a ball, he has no idea where that ball is going to go because his subconscious mind has not programmed how gravity works yet. Now, when you watch a ball bounce, your mind uses past data based off velocity. It predicts where the ball is going to go. And it's not moving you into the present. It's moving you based off the past. So think about your potential client that wants to make a change so they can grow their company, they can improve their team. If they haven't done that already, they're not going to come to a sales conversation with you with the ability to do it now because they're creating the current situation based off the past. So if we don't help them understand that in the sales conversation and their subconscious mind doesn't go, wow, I see why I'm stuck. I see how that has been creating my stuckness. They're not likely to buy unless they have a preset money belief. So there's some people you can blow on them, right? And they'll buy. It's like, you know, and, and we talked about sales numbers, like 10 people, two are likely going to buy. It'd have to be really bad for those two not to buy. Those people out of the 10 already have a money belief around moving forward. The other eight have other beliefs. And unless we reveal that eight, we lose 80% of our leads. That's such a good point. That's such a good point. Um, there, there was something you mentioned that it, it now slipped my mind, but um, it's interesting that even like in sports or in health or entrepreneurship or, you know, sales, 
it's almost like people look for this magic formula. But as you very rightly stated, is that it's almost like, okay, however old we are, we have been functioning and processing and, and conditioned in a specific way, the way we think, the way we communicate, the way we behave. And all of a sudden, when we need to change that, that's a threat to our brain. And, and you talked about subconscious. And so subconscious, like our brain is like pleasure and pain. So when we're talking about comfort and staying the same, that's a pleasure. That's like easy for them. It's an easy thing. But then there's the pain aspect. That's that when, when we think about change, our brain reflects it like this is painful. We're not going to go that route. So I'm curious, what you have you seen that or even in your own journey, what makes it easier for us? And how can one distinguish between Am I really, is this decision really not the best decision for me or this purchase or sale or whatever? Or is it that a fear factor is embedded in me because my brain sees it as a pain? Like that's difficult to distinguish. Do you have anything on that? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Cause this comes up quite often. So one of the things that's really important for someone to realize is their patterns around how they make decisions. So if someone comes to a call, one of the first things I do is I identify their patterns for making decisions. And we determine if that pattern for making decisions is giving them the results they want or not. And that's really important because if we don't establish that, their ego is going to kick in and they're going to go, well, yep, I don't need to take this offer. Do you see that? Because what you haven't established is how the brain's making the decisions. Now, once you establish that with the person, now they're aware that they're not getting the result with that way of thinking. So you can look at the offer and say, what would happen if you took this offer? And if they wanna take the offer or don't wanna take the offer, we can use the way of thinking that we've established earlier to determine whether it makes sense for them or not. So you see how you're like training them to yeah. analyze the offer themselves? But if you don't do that, what happens is they're gonna go think about it with the same thinking that has created their problem. So it's almost and, like you're, you're helping them minimize the risk of making a decision that they're going to regret. Cause that's the thing, right? Like that's the thing I feel like people bounce. It's like, you have to go with something that you feel is rewarding because again, that's the safe one. And then if you were to change somebody's mind, it's almost like you have to de-risk the process and you do it by walking through it with them so that they feel comfortable making that decision, right? Right, yeah, and the comfort really comes from clarity. So the intention of any sales conversation is to get clear on whether it makes sense for us to do work together or not. So whether they leave it's a yes or whether they leave it's a no, that's the important part, that they need to be clear about whether it makes sense for them. So the intention of the sales conversation is not for me to tell them about the product. It's not for me to try to get a sale. It's in service to them to really understand, let's get clear on why you're having this problem. Because if you understand why you're creating this problem from a homeostasis level, from a subconscious level, then you'll automatically know the right answer for yourself. But if we go into a conversation about product, features, benefits, and we haven't established anything about how that person's making decisions that's keeping them stuck, what happens at the end of the conversation? Nothing. <laughs> nothing you see why that happens nothing that you want to happen nothing that you want to happen at least <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah they likely yeah. stay stuck yeah no that that's a really good point so it, it seems like it's just all about mindset and when i think about entrepreneurship it's like it's the same thing we're running into right and um, now you got me thinking because i'm like now i'm questioning now i'm questioning my own decision making and I'm like, how do, I, how do I make decisions? So, and it's such a good point. I never thought of it from that perspective. It's like, it's yes, it's like, we, we know we should understand our own decision process, um, but it's, unless it's kind of built up in front of you, it's, it's not easy. And I'm curious how often we miss out on opportunities because we don't make certain decisions because mm -hmm. of our pre-set uh, emotions and thoughts and beliefs and stuff like that. So that's, that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, and the, the answer to that is, um, is do you, do you know, Elena, maybe you do, what percentage of ability, like conscious decision making, the subconscious mind makes when you think about making a decision, the percentage that the mind actually determines? I don't know if I know the answer, but I know that a majority, like over 90% of our thoughts are 90% are just like autopilot. Yes, so 97% essentially is autopilot. So whenever you look at the world and you go, man, that person has this nice car, that person has a nice wardrobe, that person has a nice room, that person has a nice relationship. 
97% of you is actually stopping you from having that. Yeah. Does that make well, sense? So scary. Okay. So you're, oh, this, oh, you're, you're, you're <laughs> well, you're, you're doing it based off past data to survive. So your body knows right now, let's say if I was in a relationship and I'm not happy, but it knows I'm alive in the relationship. It knows that every once in a while, this person brings me some food. See, like, so I actually have benefits to this relationship. Now, the benefits that I want, like inside my internal desires, those benefits are going to seem more scary to get than what I currently have. And that's why the subconscious mind exists. So until we really understand that and we train ourselves to recognize that consciously, most people never have a chance to make that decision. And that's why you'll see like, let's just talk about generational poverty. You'll see generational poverty. So, so uh, like a blight, you'll see generational sickness, illness, liver disease, colon cancer. You'll see them pass on from generation to generation. And that's really a result of repeating that same old pattern. Yeah, you're, you're so spot on on that. It's, um, it's, but, but how, I mean, you know, and it's, I'm so happy to have this conversation because it's something that I've been kind of discovering over the last two years on my, on myself and having, you know, again, coming from a, I think culture plays a big role, like environment and culture plays a big role on it. And coming from Russia, where we, we do not care about tomorrow. Like in Russia, people think about today because of the way that, you know, because we're always in a, you know, when we're in a communist time, it's like there was no aspiration to be more. There was no aspiration to earn more because everybody got paid the same. And then, and then, and it was always like turmoil in Russia and there's no middle class. You're either poor, you're rich, which means you're probably doing something corrupt or you're like oligarch star, which you're definitely doing something corrupt. <laughs> so it's like, there was no aspiration, you know? And so a mentality that I grew up with is like, listen, you just live your day you know you live your day and you just enjoy it because you're not promised tomorrow so when it comes to my relationship with money that was always the case and only in the last few years I recognized this pattern and 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 it's amazing how once you recognize that gap that you have you're like whoa and then you wonder like what else is there that you're not aware of because we don't know what we don't know so is there anything is there like a tip you can recommend or a question mm -hmm. people can ask themselves Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not these. Mm. Yeah. So I would look at the areas. So for example, if we just talk about retirement, okay, because a lot of a lot of what comes up for me with a lot of people is like this. There's this idea in in America, especially that like you're going to retire one day. So let's say you have a money belief around live for today. Now that money belief is going to be combined with secondary beliefs because you have a cultural belief, and then you have the people that raised you as a secondary belief. So we could use this as an example. Like when you think about retirement, Elena, and you think about your mom and your dad and how they made decisions based on taking their money around retirement. Like which one of those do you tend to duplicate? The, the, parent, the, the, the parents' belief, of course, yeah. Yeah. So did your mom and dad have an aligned belief um, around money? Well, my, my, I mean, my dad lives to uh, buy, like, buy the book today. I mean, by the day today. My mom uh -huh. shifted a little bit, but she, yeah, she's more of a planner, though. So that's a little bit different. But, um, but it only, it, it kicked in for her, like, way later when we came to America. That's when she kind of mm -hmm. changed. So if you, are you asking me which parent I would follow? Yeah, when it comes to retirement, when you look at it and the way you think about it or the way you actually take your money around retirement, do you follow your mom and your dad more? my dad hmm. yeah so do you see how like that's giving you insight around your beliefs and so your beliefs around money are going to be in different areas so like in asia like there's this very big thing i don't know if you ever heard like chinese people they don't have like a 10-year plan they have like a thousand year plan yeah. i don't know if you ever heard that right so like you have a live for the moment we have a the moment doesn't matter mentality wow so it doesn't matter if you're happy right now what will matter in 10 years if that pays off for you so a lot of Asian people become engineers. They don't love engineering. They become engineers because in 10 years, you'll thank me, son, that you're an engineer. So do you see how like the belief affects it? Now, if you take okay. myself, for instance, it's like I was being a computer engineer and I went, man, I don't want to do this. So then I got to make a new decision consciously. What am I going to do? And who I spent more time with was my mom. And my mom was a rule breaker. My dad was like, your daddy followed rules. And I had a better relationship with my mom. So which belief did I follow? 
my mom's belief. You see how it works? So it's all pre-programmed. And if we don't understand where it comes from, we think we're living our life, but we're repeating patterns from people that made us feel good in relationships. And we don't actually have any conscious decision of where we're ending up. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and also like in a world where we're just continuously distracted and what I see in our work with Besser and when we go into organizations and we work with individuals and, you know, we talk about human skills and we help techies become kind of better at leadership and stuff like that. And what I noticed is that it's not that people don't know what they should be doing. It's just they don't make time for it, which is where the work that you do, some of the work that we do, the coaching is so important because it allows you to have a conversation that is neutral, that is unbiased, that just kind of keeps it real. And it's a, a soundboard for you to think through this and for you to get asked questions that you normally would not be asked, right? And kind of like what you were doing with me now, you know, it's like, oh yeah, well, yeah, actually, if I think about it, that's true, but it requires that conversation almost. So to, to pick up on that, you mentioned mentors. And I know that's what a lot of, there's a lot of talk always about mentors and et cetera. But I'm curious, like, how does one find a mentor? Like, how did you find yours? Um, just, just curious, did, was it more structured? Was it like mentorship moments? Mm -hmm. I, I have quite a few mentors. And even now I have about three mentors that I work with. And so the first thing I ask myself is, does this mentor actually have the result that I want? Mm. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't take advice from, from a coach about how to build, you know, a seven figure business if they don't have a seven figure business. So the mentor I hired, he had a seven figure business and he did it in less than 15 hours a week. And I went, wow, okay. I want that. So how much, how much is it to, to be mentored by you? How much is it for you to coach me to create that? And it was 60,000 a year. So I invested 60,000 a year with him for three years. So I would have the skill set. Now I saw great results, but one of the things I did, cause I know how change works is I went, I could stop after year one, but what are the likelihood? What's the likelihood of me maintaining this result after a year of training? And if you take people that get in shape, if you think about someone that loses weight, how likely are they to stay in shape after a year? It's very difficult. It's less than 10% of people. Wow. So I knew I had to hold my position in life long enough that that became my new normal. Mm. And so when I pick a mentor, a lot of people do eight week programs. They do these really short 12 week programs and they get a little momentum. They feel great because they got this new information. Then you talk to them a year later and they're in the exact same place because they don't understand how change works. And so when I, when I look for a mentor, I ask myself, a few questions. The first is, have they created what I want? Two, based off my current situation, how long is it going to take me to change this? And how long is it going to take me to maintain the change? Because I don't want to invest and then lose it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing that I ask myself is this, that's really important is, does this mentor understand how change works? Because there are a lot of people that are subconsciously very competent. So they're unconsciously competent. So they can get the results but they don't know how to teach you. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's so awesome. you can hire someone who's fantastic at sales that yeah. has this, this specific behavior profile for sales, but they don't know about how any of that works. So they're showing up, they're crushing sales and you bring your sales team in to train on sales. And what happens is they don't understand how different personality types work. They don't understand how different values and motivators work. They don't understand what motivates any of these people. And they try to get them to succeed the same way they succeeded. And see, that would be a mistake in hiring a mentor. Mm -hmm. Because you can't hire a mentor who's unconsciously competent to get a result. So those are the three things that I look for is, one, they have to have created the result. Two, I have to ask myself, am I even signing up for the right program? Or am I just going to sign up for eight weeks, get some change, and then go back? And three, can this person actually teach me? Do they even understand how change works? Do they understand how to be a good teacher? Yeah. And those are the three things that I think about before I make an investment with someone. Mm. No, that, that, that's brilliant. Yeah, I really like that. Um, I definitely can relate on the, on the kind of continuous. It is, it's, 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 I mean, that's why a lot of people, a lot of athletes and sort of have those coaches and mentors and the whole team to kind of support them because it's not easy to keep going at that pace. And also you need somebody to challenge you as well. And um, I think in, in like, you know, in an entrepreneurship world, you almost have to keep yourself challenged, but like in terms of business and stuff, otherwise you just don't survive. But I think that 
it's still is so important to have those mentors and coaches. I personally have had business coaches, personal brand coaches, career coaches, therapists, you name it, uh, uh, physical, physical coaches, like uh, physical trainers as well. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I definitely can relate to that. And I think, I think it's just an investment. I think that's another thing people don't, don't recognize sometimes is the investment that it takes to get you to that level. And it just comes down to, again, that mindset, right? Like, are you ready to invest in that mindset and in yourself? And if you believe that you're good enough, if you believe you're worth it, if you believe you can actually achieve it. So it all starts with your mindset. It sounds like. Mm. It certainly does. And, and, you know, any mentor that has a conversation. So let's say it's like, if you're motivated by money and, and we get on a, a call about, let's say you making an investment to learn something from me around sales, let's say, for example. Okay. If I know you're motivated by money, I have to be in that conversation and help you find out where the money is. So I had a, a conversation with someone who says, I have a 50K program. Awesome. You got a 50K program. So if he hired me and learned to sell a 50K program, and he sold one of those every three months based off how many leads he had. What is the lifetime value of him learning how to sell $200,000 a year? Let's say he did it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So you see how it's in the millions? Yeah. So a big problem that people run into around sales is they don't know how to look at the person's business and ask the question so the person can see the return on investment. So then when they go to ask for money, there's no value present. Right. You see how that's a problem? So if I went, hey, it's $60,000 to hire me, you have a $50,000 program, they're going, oh, there's 10,000 short. Yeah. Because they're thinking about it in the way that's creating their problems. So what do you think happens to that person when they go to talk to someone about investing in their 50K program? They, yeah. don't, know how to, they don't know how to think about the value. You see how that's a problem? Yeah. So then they go, wow, no one buys this really great program that would really change their life. Yes. Because it, they're coming to the sales conversation, they can't see the value, which is their problem in sales. As a salesperson, it's our job to teach them how to see that, or they'll never actually grow their business because the unconsciousness just continues. Yeah. It passes from one person to another and it lives there like a disease. Well, it's almost like it, it takes money to make money. So you have to invest in order for you to, to kind of make more, right? That's, that's where it's at. It's just, I think the yeah, I mean, I think that if you're in that, in that position where you can invest and you can see kind of beyond that one year, then that that's where it's at. Um, in the startup world, of course, it's very different depending on kind of where you are. But um, but definitely, I mean, that's um, it's a good way to think about it. Never never thought about it that way either. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So as you're you know as you're working with individuals and you seem like you are quite a dynamic person based just based on your profile and you seems like you've done a lot of different things and multiple businesses. How do you maintain that balance? Like, you know, entrepreneurship is stressful. It's a roller coaster. It's an emotional roller coaster. Are there any habits, mm -hmm. routines that you have, or how do you help your clients or in the past maintain so they don't hit that burnout? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I find first is like knowing enough about business. Like, let's say I have, I have a fitness business. It brings me about 200K a year of passive income. Okay. So like, I've learned to manage that business in about 30 minutes to 90 minutes a week. Mm. Okay. So when I say I have multiple businesses, one of the things is I didn't create multiple jobs. I actually went like, what do I need to do to create a business? And then what do I need to, who do, how do I need to train people for the roles that are required to run this? You see that? Yeah. I know other people, they're like, I have multiple businesses. And what they're really saying is I have multiple jobs. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's one big thing that is important is because a lot of people are actually conditioned at a young age. Let's say you go to school. Well, you finish your, your work at 12 noon. Do you get to go home? No. no. So what people don't realize is subconsciously, they've actually been trained to equate success with busyness. And if people want to actually turn a profit and live a lifestyle, they have to break these rules they don't even know they have. So these multiple business owners, they're actually busy all the time because they haven't done the work it takes and they don't even realize they haven't done it. They just think being busy is the way that you make money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's like they say, they say the, the wealthy people, they buy time, right? That's, that's where it's how you buy time and you buy that time essentially by investing in the people that can run those businesses for you. But that's one of, that's where the ego kicks in because delegation is very difficult. Isaac delegation is that you have to <laughs> let go of control and you have to let things go. And that means you have to let people fail. And that's, 
you know, I mean, having a small business myself, that's so difficult right. to do. And it's, it's a mind game. I mean, it's a mind game all the time. So my business partner is way better at this than I am. I mean, he is God bless him because I don't have it in me to manage people some days, but he, he's really, really good at it. Um, but that's where the ego kicks in. It's, it's hard to let go of control. And I think that's why people stay busy. And, um, and it's, it's like, a yeah, it's, um, we're our own yeah. worst enemy sometimes. So. Yeah, I just I just feel called to share this story with you, Elena. You can anyone watching the video, you can see this lady in the back that I'm I'm holding, and that was my best friend. She worked for me, and she was a lovely person, beautiful person, and she had a hard time letting go. And she was in my health business. She was helping me like help people get healthy, and she had her own health challenges, and they were very very strange. And I remember she was doing admin work for me, and I said, "Let's get someone else to do that admin work. Why don't you just?" give it away to someone. She goes, it doesn't take me that long. It doesn't take me that long. Well, what happened was she actually passed away. Mm. One day I went to her house. She didn't answer my text for two days. I showed up at her house, knocked on the door. The dogs were barking. Her lights were on. I went, oh, that's not good. So we called the police. They went in. She had died and hit her. She had passed out and hit her head on the toilet and, and died. And we hold on to things so much and we think we can just take a little more, take a little more. And we have no idea what kind of pressures those put on our health. And when, when I really think about the work that I do, what I help people do is I help them heal from the fear of what happens when you let go of your control. So if you're in a sales conversation and you're like, I have to be in control, this person has to buy, or these things happen to me, we're in a constant state of uncertainty. That stores in the body. It brings up old trauma. And then what happens is we, we don't release the sale, but we also can't release in our business. And we don't realize that those are symptoms of actually being unhealthy from an emotional and what's called dendritic. Dendritic means holographic for the brain. The brain stores all trauma and what's called dendrites, which is hologram of the brain. And those kind of traumas, that's what actually killed my friend. Hmm. And I remember sitting with her at a restaurant, one of the last times we had a meal together. And I said, let's just get someone to do this. And she said, no, it doesn't take me long. That was my, one of my last conversations with her and she passed away. She held on to so much, beautiful, lovely person. I also tell you from a business owner standpoint, when one of your people that was key to your company dies, passes away, and you didn't have a system to be able to give it away, how stressful is that for your business? Hmm. if something happens to you right now and you can't delegate you don't delegate you don't have systems how does your business run without you hmm. so we think we're just holding on to things because we're control freaks what we're really doing is we're stopping our business from succeeding we're stopping ourselves from taking vacation and we're making ourselves ill and when you're ill and you can't go on vacation and your systems aren't developed and you pass away or you get sick, what's going to happen to your business? That is powerful. Yes. I, 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 I think that was, that, that was the biggest takeaway from this is everything you just said in the last few minutes. <laughs> That's beautiful. You're absolutely correct. It's, it's, it's just hearing that, I think, and I'm so glad you're saying this. And I'm, I'm hoping that the, the audience and the listeners will, will really take this to heart. Um, it's, um, it's, it's very true. Everything that you said, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to move forward. So it's, yeah. but I, I mean, I, I don't know the, I don't know a better way to, to end this conversation, to, but at that, I don't even have any, I don't even know where to take it from here. I mean, I felt like that was, I need a moment after that. <laughs> well, you, you, you take a, take a moment and maybe I'll share something. It's like, you know, what I learned is that people don't have health problems. They don't have business problems. They have emotional problems that create health problems. If we think about overeating, if we think about emotionally eating, it's like, that's an emotional problem that you're trying to numb out with food. And in business, we have emotional problems. We're trying to numb out by getting value. Like a lot of us are in business because if we want to stand out, we have to be valuable. Like, I'm going to learn all these things. I'm going to be the one who can do these better than everyone. That's our payoff. We don't realize it's killing us because we're still reacting to that old wound of growing up Chinese or Russian or Hispanic and needing to be good enough to belong. And we bring that into our business as a business owner. We say, look at me, I'm standing out. And what we're really doing is making ourselves sick. 
because we haven't healed the wound. And the reason we get sick is the universe is actually saying, you haven't healed this. The pain is a sign that you haven't healed this. So do the work that it takes to heal this. Not only will your business benefit, but it'll heal your soul in a level that you could never get to any other way. Mm. And that's really the work that I teach people because making money is not difficult. Living in alignment with money, that's not as simple. Mm -hmm. And whatever we had is past trauma, we carry that into trying to live in alignment. Mm. And it manifests as not being able to have control, having money shame, being angry when people um, make us feel like, quote, they make us feel like we don't have value. And that's really, you know, that's really the medicine that I give to the world because I had all these things and they were so painful for me. I actually uh, lost my voice for two months. I got strep, couldn't talk. And as a coach, a consultant and a health person, it's like, wow, I'm really ill. So like, why am I, why am I ill right now? <laughs> and I had to go find it out. And I realized, wow, I'm like pulling, pulling a lot of these things. So, you know, what I'm hoping that you get from this, if, if you're listening to this, is that if your business is not in the place that you want it to be, it's not just a matter of strategy. It's about healing the emotion, healing the belief that you grew up with, but is now limiting your business. The thing missing in your business is just the symptom of the belief that you inherited. Mm -hmm. And it can either run your business or you can heal it and end it for you and your legacy. And those are your options. Mm -hmm. But you know what we like to do? We like to put band-aids on broken legs, Isaac. That's what we try to do. We don't want to get to the root cause. It's painful, like you said. That's, but that's, that's how you right. get it. I mean, if we're not challenged, if we're not painful, I mean, if we're not going through it, we're not really changing. And then it's it's a uh, you know everything else is just a side effect of that. So it's um it's I love everything you said. I think it's spot on, and I am so happy that you're out there doing these things. And I'm so happy that you came came on this podcast and shared this and I can't wait for this to be released so people can hear it and uh, I think it's gonna be awesome um, oh, listen good. where can people find you if somebody wants to get in touch with you uh, are you on any social media where do you hang out mm -hmm. yeah not, not really on social media um, you know one of the things I teach people how to do is how to build you know multiple six-figure businesses without really marketing so you can find me um, online. It's at Isaac Ho Coaching. It's I-S-A-A-C-H-O coaching.com. That's my website. Um, but the best way to, to get in touch with me is you can actually text me at 66866. And if you just text the word and, A-N-D, that will put you in communication with me and we can have a conversation to get clarity on how to excel in your business, health, and your life. Awesome. And I'll make sure to include that in uh, post-production as well. So it's awesome. Listen, thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. I, I mean, there were so many aha moments and goosebumps that I've gotten from it. So thank you very much for coming on. And maybe we can have a chat, another chat again sometime. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Elena.